So Anastasia and Hugo, the mic is on you. And if you want to share some things about yourself or yeah, take it on. Sure, with with pleasure. Yeah, maybe we could start with with a quick introductions and uh, talking a little bit about what we do and how we got to this space. Because I guess for both of us, we we came from quite different backgrounds. Yet there is something that unites so many of us in this space, regardless of where we have uh, come from. So maybe while Hugo is preparing to put up the slides, uh, please, I could uh, quickly talk about my path here. I was mostly, most of my life in the space of international organizations, um, system change and community building. So I had some senior roles at the World Economic Forum, the UN. So for me, it was an exploratory journey of how the world works <laughs> right now and what uh, pillars of international organizations are there to support multi-stakeholderism and also uh, governance systems around the world. My discovery through these experiences was mainly that nothing seems to be working anymore and uh, many of these systems are falling apart in front of our very eyes, yet uh, there is no governance theory or practical models to be replacing those. So that led me to the journey of trying to understand through research and practice of how things could look um, differently and what uh, the possible alternatives are to current economic, educational, social, uh, financial governance systems. So Restate Foundation, which I co-founded with a few other people who have arrived to the same conclusion, uh, we focus on the future of governance, understanding how uh, new paradigms for governance could look like to make sure these paradigms are more inclusive, human-centric, at least partially decentralized, hopefully fully decentralized in the future. And we do it from several angles. We look at the research of how these things could look like. We go into theory uh, of the you know, network sovereignties that we're going to talk about, but also what are the current arrangements that are being implemented around the world that sort of move the needle in, in a new direction. We also do uh, practice. So we work with existing states who are willing and ready to experiment. Very few of those, I'm not going to lie, but they exist. And we also work with what we call the new societies, uh, private cities, interesting new governance arrangements, DAOs, that are seeking uh, novel ways to uh, experiment in this space. And we also do a lot of awareness building, just like we do now, to talk about these matters, because, you know, this is our world. I do not go any day without talking about future of governance and how the society of the future could look like. So very excited to be here uh, with all of you to, to discuss some more. So I can um, hand over from here. So. Very nice to meet you all, and thanks again for the invitation, uh, and thanks for your time in such an important matter. Uh, so I'm Hugo, I'm, I'm the founder of Tools for the Commons. I'm coming mostly from an entre entrepreneurial background, so I've been building many different ventures, mostly in the financial services industry, and trying to bundle, unbundle, unbundle and rebundle money in any of its forms and in, in many different contexts and geographies. Uh, and, uh, and I've been always in between the market and the state. So how can we change the law to create new ways to channel money into people who are uh, not very well included into this money contract that's a stake market kind of contract. And, it, and it's been very frustrated, frustrating to uh, be able only to move very marginally the, the needle. So at best, um, I've been able for the past decade to channel nicely funds into entrepreneurs and into communities and into uh, small and mid-sized businesses all over the all over the world. But to take it to the next level, um, I needed to operate a shift in a layer that fits below money, which is actually governance, which is actually the very nature of our social contract and the very way. Uh, we organize our institutions and toolings uh, that is exclusively, almost exclusively a state and market mechanism. And uh, and as a, also a tech entrepreneur, uh, I, I see clearly in the internet 
And in peer-to-peer -peer technologies, uh, very interesting ways to rearrange our social contracts and our social arrangements through new governance systems. So this is what I'm very enthusiastic to present to you today uh, with Anastasia. And I think we, we form a very complementary uh, duo here. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, clarify um, some of the aspects and would love to know more from you. So if it's okay, I, I can kick off here. Um, yeah, I could just add a little something, Hugo, which I meant to yeah. say <laughs> at the end of my little intro. Uh, how we met was actually quite interesting because we met about a year ago through a friend, uh, Michelle Bowens, who is one of the leading figures in peer-to-peer -peer communication, commons-based governance. So um, there are a few players in this space actually growing by day. But back then, I think just a year ago, we were uh, quite a few. And so every uh, revelation of other people in this space was an interesting one. And I fully agree, you know, we're acting very complementary here uh, through theory and, and, and practice through more of a research-based um, approach and, and more practice-based. So let's take it away, Hugo. <laughs> yeah, and I really recommend um, Michelle's reading uh, and Michelle's content. It's, it's absolutely amazing and it's been transformational for both Anastasia and myself. So uh, I really recommend his, his readings about peer-to-peer -peer technologies. So um, jumping into the future of governance and some tools to, to restore the commons. Um, we'll start with the introduction uh, and articulating the problem. So the biggest problem from a, from a very practical perspective is that governance is one of the only and probably the last very big industries, industry that is still monopolistic. And the reason for that is that we don't consider it as an industry. We, we think that it's a, it's a legacy, that it's a immutable, and we don't understand this as a, as, a, as a service that is provided, but we understand this as something immutable over time, uh, literally like almost like, uh, like God. And this creates a monopole of governance. And worse than that, we have the illusion that it's not a monopoly because we change the representative of this operating system every three, four, five, six, seven years. So we change basically the, the comedians, uh, which uh, fake a change of system, but we don't actually change the system. So changing the comedians, um, we live in the illusion that it's actually not a monopoly and, uh, and that there's actually like a competitive dynamics, but it's a, these are competitive dynamics, not at the very root of how the system works. So governments are monopolistic. Uh, and the reason for this is that there's no way to exit them. Uh, and there's no way to exit a social contract, even leaving the geographic boundaries where this social contract applies. In many instances, it follows everyone just because of the zip code uh, of birth. Um, and uh, and we see increasingly that uh, the problem is not democracy, but it's really the operating system that runs it or that supposedly runs it. And and in many instances, it's it, it's it's not as democratic as as it should be. And then this leads to mismanagement. So this it leads to mismanagement mostly about our shared resources and our common resources, whether tangible or intangible. And it's mostly, and this operating system mostly serve an elite, so states slash market elite that um, um, that make most and that gets most of the benefit of this operating system, but is definitely not thought to restore the commons, to regenerate the commons, and to create a a paradigm of uh, shared ab abundance. So uh, the way we work is is typically either two D. As a, as a market dynamic, so like a bilateral buy and sell mechanism, or as a monopolistic service provider, which is the state that monopolistically takes resources from the one side, reorganize them and redistribute them from the other side. But technically, this is like a very simple industry that's called asset management, but governments don't call themselves asset managers. They call themselves like a monopolistic providers and legitimate, but at the end of the day, it's all about asset management. And we need an asset management service provider that can manage the assets in a way of shared abundance. And neither 
the, the market dynamics nor the state dynam dynamics have been able to operate this so far. And this is where come these um, special governance arrangements or network states or coordination solutions as a part of, part of the solution. So theoretically, it's, it's been um, it's been articulated by people such as Ostrom back in the 90s of how decentralized approaches and community-based approaches could uh, could facilitate uh, cooperation and could facilitate uh, local and global abundance. And, uh, and also some su subsequent works have been mostly focused on um, how to adapt to rapidly changing environments uh, that were not the assumption back 200, 300 years ago when those structures have been put in place. So um, when we look at this timeline of um, ideological, political, economical, and more recently, technological uh, innovations, uh, we can get now to very new paradigms and to very new operating systems that help us organize in completely new ways based uh, on a community first approach and based on the uh, regenerative administration of the local and global commons. Um, and uh, and I would hand over uh, to Anastasia on on this slide mostly, which is what we are both working hard on, which is the ability to exit. So if we think about it, even from a market perspective or from a service provider pers perspective, when we provide a bad service, we can exit to a better service. So when we when we propose a specific paradigm. And if we really offer an alternative paradigm where we can shift from one paradigm to the other, and when we start shifting many users from the old paradigm to the new paradigm, then the new paradigm naturally substitutes the old paradigm because of, of user transition. And, and this one is the, the right to exit. And this right to exit um, is something extremely important. So this is how and why this monopoly of governance has to be broken and uh, alternatives have to be tested. And we don't exactly know what will be the best alternative, but, the, but getting the ability to test new things and to permit a user movement from one system to another system and let the best system naturally win, which will be the system giving more uh, benefits to its users, will turn the old system obsolete. And this is why and how um, based on companies and foundations and awareness, uh, we want to promote those ideas. So with this, I'm, I'm passing the ball to uh, Anastasia here. Great. So um, as Hugo was leading uh, up to, the, um, there is a, a, a very dire need for some sort of transformation that is currently taking place. And uh, I agree with, uh, I think it was Jonas who said that it's it's been around, this, this thinking has been around for at least seven to 10 years, uh, way before Balaji wrote his book, The Network State, which we're gonna talk about. Uh, these uh, ideas were already circulating and uh, taking shape. And at the core of the transformations, the way we see it right now, lies the concept, you know, let's call that for now, for the lack of the better word, we call it the network sovereignties. It's a term coined to describe the emergence of uh, self-sovereign networked political communities that operate as an engine for global coordination that transcend traditional definitions of political and uh, geographical sovereignty. What's interesting about network sovereignties is that they do not seek to replicate the state-centric models of sovereignty, and they do not seek to replace uh, the institution of the state Instead, they exist in parallel with uh, the state formations, with current institutions, and they serve as animating forces for coordination and cooperation in coordinated uh, interconnected world. And because they're not confined by geographic uh, borders and boundaries, these network sovereignties could facilitate the free flow of ideas, information, digital assets, uh, resources, and they are of huge interest uh, to us. These new political communities offer a novel perspective on the whole concept of sovereignty, uh, where, you know, while the traditional state sovereignty is rooted in territorial control, here uh, we have the situation where, uh, where sovereignty is exercised by non-state entities, 
uh, and we call it more of the functional sovereignty. Uh, and we see already in the world many um, communities operate as such because sovereignty effectively means being able to govern uh, oneself. So uh, with, the, with the advent of functional sovereignty in the digital age, uh, way more solutions are possible. And there is a whole new dimension to exercise control over the governance and operations of digital platforms. And uh, the control of digital resources could be redistributed uh, among its members. It allows for the governance structures to become fresh and new without uh, being dictated by the rules of the market or the rules of the state. So as a result of individuals and businesses find themselves subject to uh, self-governance, commons-based governance and, and, and self-control. So uh, we can talk about some features of uh, what we see emerging through network sovereignties. Uh, first of all, they're voluntary. Uh, they provide additional layers that uh, exist parallel to the traditional forms. They usually focus around shared ideologies, values, aspirations, societal visions. They are based on affinity and kinship as opposed to geographic proximity. You know, for personal example, I've lived in some uh, 13 different countries, so I do not have that much of the national affiliation with just about anything, yet there's no way for me to uh, legally manifest, uh, you know, how I feel inside. So the shared ideology helps create spaces where people could exercise the affinity and kinship and the collective identity in a brand new way. Uh, the participation is opt in again, as opposed to what current arrangements uh, provide. It allows for self-determination, but also interdependency and mutualization of resources. And through the network sovereignties, we have capacity to engage in collective action. Uh, if we could just move to the next one, Hugo. Uh, what interests me in, in, in this uh, regard is also the fact that we can integrate global perspective with localized insights because you could be a member of a network sovereignty from just about anywhere and you are able to care about things that are way beyond the state boundaries uh, and exercise um, aspirations together with your peers they that go uh, way beyond uh, the narrow uh, state interests. Uh, it's curious uh, how we can think about these digital communities potentially entering into diplomatic relationship with other communities or international organizations or traditional nation state states to form alliances and collaborations uh, with them. And uh, what's especially exciting is that through these new arrangements, we could really redefine governance as we know it and reinvigorate the commons because in the traditional realms, it's very difficult to experiment. Uh, yes, states sometimes do that, uh, but it's very rare and there are no experimental spaces in the world right now where new governance could be exercised through trial and error. So network sovereignty is definitely uh, provide for that. Now, having said that, uh, we need to understand that the scholarly <laughs> knowledge of network sovereignties is only starting to emerge, uh, and so do practical uh, things surrounding them. So there are very few examples of, of such network sovereignties, and we're going to talk about them. But even inside those, there are also some interesting terms, for example, the network state uh, that, that Hugo will now talk about. But we need to understand that this is an emerging uh, piece of scholarship and uh, we do not have all the answers just yet. We're just observing the trend and try to deliver it to you uh, through the terms and the concepts that are already known. So Hugo, if you could uh, talk a little bit about the, the network state as one example of, of the network sovereignty theory. Sure, so it's one of the examples and, and even within the network state uh, concept, there are many sub concepts of how to create one single unit of special governance and also how to coordinate those different units. Um, so I will go through one of those who had um, a big marketing and, and, and a big audience, but it's a, 
one very specific iteration and one very specific way of understanding how those networks sovereignties could be operated. So if we go through um, the Balaji's definition of what is a network state to run and operate network sovereignties, we are discussing here a highly aligned online community with the capacity for collective action that crowdfunds territory around the world and eventually gains diplomatic recognition from pre-existing states. So what this image show is what could be a state equivalent KPI and state equivalent um, image of what many social platforms already do. If we think about social media, if we think about social platforms, if we think about crypto and tokenizations, we typically have a number of users and we typically have KPIs that uh, are good proxies to GDP, gross domestic pro product, but instead of being subject to a zip code uh, and uh, where the, the sum of those assets and all the rights in terms of um, unilateral extraction of value from those assets is coming from a nation state, we could start not only not from a single zip code approach to define wealth, but from a network approach um, to define wealth or a platform approach to define wealth. So if we start uh, comparing this to Facebook or WeWork, for instance, but if we attached a diplomatic component to it, and if we attach a territorial component to it, let's suppose that we all tokenize, or we all um, make the network available of many of our assets, and we register them into a distributed notary, this could be giving the like a very compelling country if we would compare it with the, the national GDPs of um, in the world. So for instance, with a, pop a population as low as 1.7 million people, we could quickly get uh, to an annual income of uh, um, around like $150 billion, which is pretty significant, which would, would make it very competitive from a country perspective. And with a very, or at least with a non insignificant territorial um, approach uh, that would be more than a, a hundred million square meters. So many platforms did that already without the territorial component. Uh, just to crowdfund resources and to organize resources. But if we tie this to a diplomatic recognition, let's imagine a constellation of Singapore and Hong Kong and, uh, and special economic zones all together that are all networked and that all follow the same kind of social arrangement, we could very quickly get to the top 50 GDPs in the world with diplomatic recognition. So, um, so that's an introduction of the concept. Um, and with this, we could very likely rebuild um, very powerful institutions. And uh, we could do this iterating and adding new members and, and, and crowdfunding territories all over the world into, into completely new sets of uh, arrangements. Um, so that's for the, the definition of what it is a network state, again, there's a book on this called the networkstate.com uh, that's available on that website. It's one specific iteration, so very software driven, very also I, very Silicon Valley driven in my opinion, um, but at least it's a very functional and practical set of steps towards this vision. And I think what it becomes very interesting when we combine this with social and political and economical approaches, and we we, and we use inter, interoperability with the existing institutions. Um, and the next chapter I would like to jump in is um, what is governance? So, so far we discussed a framework and uh, what really raised, rose my attention a few months ago is to understand that governance is a service in the same way, same way that banking is a, is a service. So we need banking, but we don't need banks. And, and it was completely crazy to think about it 20 years ago. And now we unbundle banking completely with tons of applications for our payments and credit and insurance and payments and even crypto. And governance is pretty much the same thing. 
we need governance, but we don't need uh, zip code tied uh, 19th century embedded governments. So how can we shift from the old government style to governance? And we definitely need governance using this as a constellation of microservices of many different service providers that could be unbundled and rebundled as per uh, the desire of those sovereign societies. Uh, and here are, are many um, different ways of unbundling and rebundling uh, some social agreements in a networked and consensual way. I can discuss some of them. Uh, others are also very well known by, uh, by Anastasia Wells as well. So here I can quickly go over, I mean, DAOs, you guys know very well what is, what is a DAO, but when we use even the example of some nation states such as Estonia, it's very interesting the work they've been doing since the late 90s to digitalize completely the state, even if, if they digitalized an operating system of a very old nature, uh, they made a UX that is of a very modern nature to, to, to create the interaction with, uh, with citizens. Um, and uh, there's, for instance, Taiwan that created um, uh, a very interesting direct democracy model whereby um, direct civic initiatives could reframe and repropose and repurpose entire public institutions and sub submit this um, to an, a specific institution administ administered by Audrey Tang uh, that has been doing an amazing work on the space to basically adjust on a very dynamic basis the set of laws in the country just based on direct civic initiatives, uh, cutting intermediaries and bypassing the 5149 a traditional approach with cycles of four to six years. Uh, maybe Anastasia, you wanted to discuss other innovations that many of them, I mean, you're the master on many of them, so. So I can just mention a couple of them because I think it's a very interesting uh, paradigm where we can see some incremental changes on the, on the side of the existing states and some bolder moves uh, on the side of new network sovereignties and a new emerging societies, yet we should not neglect what is actually happening inside traditional systems because some of them are innovating in a very interesting way. Here maybe I'd like to mention uh, quadratic voting, which is a concept that is uh, quite well known to those in the DAO space. If you don't know it, I uh, encourage you to read uh, about it. It's very interesting because it gives the nuanced uh, spectrum of preferences of people as opposed to just one person one vote and uh, having started with more of the DAO decentralized spaces it has actually moved into more traditional governance for example the state of Colorado has been testing some of these solutions quite successfully now with with a few more states um, hopefully picking that up another interesting one uh, is what's going on right now uh, in Barbados, we actually have partnered with them as, as Restate Foundation, and we are providing to them uh, possibilities of decentralized AI polling, where people could uh, be answering questions from the government be, without the government being able to trace who said what. They would just they would see the end result that you know 80% of uh, females from 80 to 35 think this or that, but they would never be able to see who exactly said what exactly. So these kind of solutions could actually spill over to the new societies as well, because we would need uh, ideas for everything from money issuance to identity management, to arbitration, to conflict resolution. So we could get inspired by something that is actually happening inside the traditional system, just as much as uh, outside of those. Uh, back over to you, Hugo. Good, great. and. And this leads us to one of the new tentative frameworks that uh, we've been putting together of how to organize the, the new governance structures. So here I'm, I'm mostly replicating um, a concept developed by Noah Chanli. So he's uh, one of the key contributors to Zuzalu. Uh, and uh, and many of the, the carve-outs from Zuzalu that was uh, an initial gathering last year 
discussing the future of governance and, and how new governance structures could be applied mostly for public goods and public services. And I really like this framework um, to basically organize microservices by categories. So some microservices are the hosts. So we saw this with China back, uh, back in the era of uh, Deng Xiaoping with one country, two systems. And it could become a new norm for even constitutions through constitutional amendments or municipal carve-outs or state carve-outs of governance to host different kinds of sandbox in the same way that banks created those sandbox a few decades ago, two decades ago, to incubate the first fintechs. Uh, and then even when they cut this relationship, the fintechs could move around different banks and be hosted within different banks. And then in a second moment, um, there was new kinds of licenses. So it could even become directly um, uh, new kind of financial institutions that were digital first could emerge and the regulatory environment could adapt to this new reality in the second stage. So the host country is the first one. We could have a constellation of host countries in the world that do recognize that alternative governance is an interesting way to test social models. And uh, those new social arrangements online and or peer-to-peer -peer and or crypto arrangements could occur within a... Uh, a regulatory sandbox and hosts. And on top of this, we could create new social models. So what we discussed in the previous slide here of those new kind of social contracts could all be uh, institutionally recognized within a host country that could use this as a parallel institutionally recognized state in the same way that China had the special economic zones that started with Hong Kong and then extrapolated to Shanghai and Shenzhen and Guangdu and so on, we could have the same on a global scale with this common denominator being the internet um, sub-hosting some new social contracts that could be institutionally and constitutionally recognized. And then come the physical infrastructure layer. So when we discuss some tooling to restore the commons and organize societies in a different way, many of them are of a, a, an intangible nature so typically organizing social contracts and currencies and knowledge is of an intangible nature, but many are of a very tangible nature. So how can we organize water and territories and energy and so on? And, and this is where we could tie the zip code to this parallel operating system for states and then tie the operating system of physical infrastructure to this new legal framework. So one example, think about distributed energy. So if we connect many solar panels all over the world, and if we create a distributed energy grid, and this becomes the um, physic decentralized physical infrastructure, or if we do the same for the internet or for the cloud or for storage, for instance, we could tie this inf in physical infrastructure operator to a new legal framework that recognizes it uh, to basically take a ride on this uh, on this new physical infrastructure and connect new legal frameworks with countries and with physical infrastructure. And when we once we have those three layers, on top of this, we could have the community management. So how can you create a digital nation? How can you create a company? How can you create a foundation? How can you, how can you create an association that have a common social contract and, and common shared values that could be all operated and hosted by, by the below uh, components. So I know that is, it's quite a shift when we understand uh, governance, but all of this is governance. All of this is governance of public goods, but we could, we could start to unbundle this and organize this into layers and compose this to better serve, uh, to better serve societies. Um, and, uh, and what we work a lot on is how to organize those microservices by layer, how to open it as a catalog where communities and states and even builders could connect their needs and could connect their solutions um, in a very well organized fashion. But we also work a lot on interoperability. 
So how can we connect a specific monetary policy or credit system with a new country and to make it compatible with their central banks? Or how can we connect an education system with an existing education of system of a specific country and then bundle them? So uh, that's one of the big work we do, this interoperability of all those microservices in the same way that uh, we can pay in for instance, in, um, in stable coins within a uh, consumer app uh, like PayPal to pay our taxes in the US. So this is an example of interoperability of very different systems that could of a very different natures, natures that are connected. Uh, and the objective is to do this for um, all of the public goods management. So where are we now in uh, all of this? Um, we are at a point where I think we are post startup societies and pre network state uh, in terms of feasibility study. So, what is a startup society? Is a society organized as a startup with a trial and error mechanism where uh, we can test at the small scale using a startup playbook and we can fail quickly and double down also very quickly on governance tentatives without damaging the, all of the societies when something work well and having the ability to double down on good experiments uh, in a very fast fashion. So I think this is the startup society. There are many pop-up villages and special economic zones that host this kind of startup societies. And we are pre-network state. So we are still very far from having a global standard and global definition of what is this network? What, is, what are these set of standards? what is and is not recognized. Um, but I think we'll progressively head there. Um, and here are a few examples of um, network state tentatives. So, and they are all over the world. So they are in Africa, like our world in Zanzibar, Afropolitan, which is intangible, but it's been founded by Nigerians, Prospera in Central America, the Pan-Armenian network state, so in the Near East, uh, Telosa in the US, et cetera. So we have uh, roots and experiments of a physical nature, others of a digital nature. I think we need both to have something functional because otherwise it's just a, what, a WhatsApp group. Uh, and when it's just physical, it's just a new Singapore or Dubai and, it's, and it doesn't capture the network and peer-to-peer -peer effects of a, of a sovereign society. Uh, here are a few examples uh, um, like uh, the digital free zone of Zanzibar um, is a 100-year agreement that, uh, that has been passed initially as a PPP and that would progressively become a regulator um, of a one jurisdiction, two systems uh, hosted in Zanzibar to create a very uh, attractive place, mostly for digital nomads, but also for new communities willing to have a sovereign society uh, to create this, uh, this potential development strategy uh, for Zanzibar, for Tanzan Tanzania, and for Africa as a whole. Um, and there are other experiments, uh, such as Itana in Nigeria, uh, which is a pop-up village or startup societies uh, thought for tech entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and thought for SMBs in Nigeria with facilitated business environments. Uh, there's Afropolitan, uh, which is a digital first network state sustaining and supporting the African and black values around the world. And, and the main understanding here is that uh, traditional democracies just have not worked for black people. Uh, uh, and, and then new kinds of... Uh, governance could be tested for uh, for black communities and afro descendants and uh, and african people as a whole so we'll leave you here and and to, to close this i would love anastasia to discuss a few questions to explore together here uh, which is what drives our day to day uh, we don't necessarily have the um, set in stone answers but these are very very interesting questions to ask ourselves and to work very hard on. Yes, sure. And um, I would also love to share one of the recent examples I came across in the 
uh, network sovereignty space, uh, which is actually very practical. Uh, you may have heard some of you, it's called the cabin. Cabin, it's a network city, the new one, and it has a very practical uh, meaning behind it. It's done for people to uh, come together to co-live and, and co-create in the nature. So it uses a lot of regenerative practices. It uh, is actually quite close to be in the network state or the net network sovereignty as uh, they have citizens who are given the passports that give them access to co-living in, in residences around Cabin uh, neighborhoods. And they're targeting 5,040 people as, as founding citizens being able to move um, through uh, the network of, of these cities around America. And this is the number that, that Aristotle actually thought made an ideal police. So very governable and, and, and uh, just the right number to take care of um, a shared co-living space together. And uh, they really want people to be happy living with, with others they admire. So they're solving something very practical and pragmatic, yet with an in, you know, the digital aspects and the governance aspects of, um, of the network sovereignties. So we're, we're looking closely at uh, examples like that. And yeah, some of the questions that we have put uh, up on the screen is something that we will need to resolve and understand as you know, practice is, is, has started to pick up with the theory. Uh, we need to understand what kind of transition uh, needs to be enabled, what it means to move from the nation state based system to the network sovereignty's big system. Uh, what is their role in terms of the international law? Do they have to have a definition? Do they have to uh, have specific features to be called that? And how we evolve as a society and how do our mental models evolve so that we can uh, reach the new highs and how we relate to each other and ourselves? Because uh, it's not just the shift on the outside that needs to happen, but also the, the change within us in order for us to be able to live in, in, in societies of, of a new paradigm. So we will leave you with um, several questions here. Uh, I know we're, we're quite short on time uh, and we could talk about it <laughs> all day, every day. Uh, so if there's uh, still some space for questions, we very much welcome that and your thoughts, of course. Thank you very much, Anastasia and Hugo. Uh, amazing, amazing talk. Uh, yeah, we have I think thirteen more minutes for Q and A, if you can stay if you can stay with us. And Bezir has a question. Thank you very much. Wow, what a, a very well thought out uh, presentation. Thoughts definitely uh, something worth uh, publishing. Thank you very much for all the wonderful work. Actually, uh, ju I just wanted to share observations and uh, what I see as possible threats, because the biggest threat to this model is going to be criminal enterprises. And when I say criminal enterprises and criminal networks, I'm not talking about just your uh, regular criminals, but also corrupt networks. Uh, there was a terrible, uh, there were multiple uh, earthquakes in Turkey that killed tens of thousands of people. And it was not just the building contractors or people who neglected. It was more of an entire corrupt judicial system, municipality and politicians so you know it really they, it really hasn't gone up through that food chain it really hasn't gone up to that food chain so that is uh, going to be it's going to require a lot of uh, activism uh, on that part so i wish you the best of luck uh godspeed uh, so thank you i won't take much more for this thank you thank you thank you Basir. uh jennifer Hey, um, so I, are you, I just wanted to suggest a couple of projects that would probably have ideas that would integrate really well with, um, with what you're organizing. Are you familiar with Tony Lane Casserly? It will always yeah. be too soon. Yes. Yeah. We okay. were so rest in peace. Yes. Yes, of course. Okay. P perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah. So just, just for anybody who may not have. She has a TED talk from years ago where she talks about instead of um, being subjected to nation states, we should be in a position where governments are competing for our citizenship. And I think that's what you're talking about. And I think that's a really exciting idea. Michael Tellinger um, in South Africa 
has a project called Ubuntu and there's like a big fat book about it. I haven't read it for a long time, so I can't really put in details, but he worked out a system where communities could live in parallel with government without actually being in conflict with government and gradually, um, well, not gradually, but like obviously with consent, maybe take over different parts of the government, like maybe the water supply or the electric company or something, but um, also working with governments. And I don't know the details about how that, how he had that worked out, but I know that there were some experimental Ubuntu communities. Um, I'm planning to look into that because it's obviously becoming super relevant. And that's really all I had. Thank you for doing the work. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonas, did you want to ask something? Um, yeah, I was. Um, I mean, we already talked a bit about that in the chat. I was wondering how important is the physical um, component in, in that stack for you guys? Like, do you think it is paramount that we do have um, pieces of land and uh, physical infrastructure? Um, like uh, in, in the network state um, to achieve that? Or does it also work fully non-physical, like like only digital that may, maybe um, what Jennifer just said as well, that, you know, you um, build up just uh, digital things and then you build communities there. And then maybe over time you, you take over some parts of it without actually owning any land, um, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, Jonas, it could be very different because on the one hand, not having any physical space uh, kind of removes the necessity to maintain the physical infrastructure, which opens up, you know, the the kind like the the sovereignty uh, budget uh, to allocate to something else. Uh, at the same time, we are the physical being, so we need spaces to live uh, on. We need security and protection. Um, just like it was mentioned before, you know, security is huge and, you know, in the context of uh, the network states, it's yet to be decided how exactly that will be handled. So my sort of gut feeling is that we will probably land somewhere in the hybrid space where certain things will be exercised in the digital realm completely, arbitration, identity, possibly education, all things that are or that are light that that could be not uh, non physical yet we will have to either have arrangements with existing systems to provide physical infrastructures or we have to build our own uh, but physical spaces would also be important uh, in that sense yeah and to complement this i think it's all about what kind of sovereign societies do we want and what kind of um, social interactions and social singularity do we want so uh, we could certainly have a digital only or digital first version of the network sovereignties or network states where we all interact um, and on a digital platform, but this exists already. So Bitcoin is one of them. Um, social networks to a certain extent or to the extent they are decentralized, they are already a, a, a digital first version of non-territorial uh, network sovereignties. But if we want to craft a world, and I think it's, it's the vision we have with Anastasia, where uh, technology serve social abundance and social abundance is above all determined by the degree of oxytocin we produce ourselves and the degree of responsibility we, we, we create and, the, uh, and care to others and the society of love and consideration as, as a collaboration, for this, we definitely need a physical component. So we are we are beings that think for sure, but we are also beings that that uh, hear, that live, that breathe, and um, and we are social animals and we are social beings. Uh, and 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 the physical component to this uh, cannot be neglected. And I think if we want to create institutions that serve this. And if we believe and agree that it's a desirable society and that we want to craft institutions that serve that, then, then we can't disconsider the physical aspect to this because we have to gather somehow um, on the physical space and, and to use those technologies um, to serve institutions and collaboration and not the opposite. 
Yeah. Can I just add to this as, as I was listening to you, Hugo? I thought how critically important it will be to start creating new institutions. It's actually been a while since humanity has come up with something completely different in that space. So I could easily see, you know, new think tanks and, you know, sort of like centers of excellence doing nothing but creating new institutions that would cater to the needs of new societies because everything has to be reimagined. Well, the current uh, institutions are effectively becoming obsolete, yet there's almost no building of the new ones. So uh, these new ideas will need to come alive through like physical or non-physical institutions that will have to be created. That's, that's beyond doubt. Yeah, I, um, I think I can, I can all, I can totally see that side of things. And I definitely agree. I mean, yeah, we are uh, physical things. We need to, um, breathe and eat and, and things. Um, I'm just thinking that like I can see also some ways how we can create institutions without actually being our own country, so to say, or, or having like owning a physical piece of land just by, like there are some universities and then if there are some engaging professors, they do something different, do something in the lines of what, what that community wants. Um, they can still be adopted and the university can change or so. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I see, see what you guys um, mean. I think what I can contribute here in a very personal answer here, I, I think it doesn't have to be fixed and it doesn't have to be uh, immutable, but it has to exist. And actually the more dynamic it is, uh, the the better. So to create, coming back to one of those comments, a governance competition, I think we could also create a territorial competition and a governance competition. So for instance, if this kind of the governance doesn't make sense or only makes sense for a short period of time within a specific territory, then I think it's completely fine to have something evolutive and uh, uh, and then to to shift around the footprints. And I think these kind of institutions could be also a very interesting way to move the borders of the world without secessions and wars, which is something that we never saw in history. So if we could have peaceful uh, consensus-based boundaries that are move around the world, uh, and we can call it a country or a network or a sovereignty, I think... I think the very idea of country will have to change a lot in the next few years and, and decades. Uh, but we have a great opportunity to create, to have like non-violence, non-war related um, shifts in, uh, in borders. And I think it's a very interesting paradigm to build this. That was amazing. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Hugo. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, see Thank you, you soon, so I guess. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye bye. See you soon. See ya. Thank you very much.